welcome again to my show, Searching for Integrity. My name really is John Smith, and I'm searching for people with integrity. Why? Because our country suffers from IDD, Integrity Deficit Disorder. We have as our guest today, Danielle Claude. Her book, Koala, A Natural History and Uncertain Future. Did I get that right? Sure I did. did. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I want to uh, congratulate you on all the books you've written. You had a ton of those, Four, 14 I counted. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing it for a while now. <laughs> That's good. And, and especially this one you have here, this is, uh, uh, I, I think that well, I fell in, in, in love with a you know, koala and my, uh, you know, all my friends and whatever, you, everybody would just say, going to the zoo, but things that weren't very population wise at the, at the zoo. Is that true in Australia? Um, and do you, do you mean in terms of how many there are around? You, yeah, well, just, yes, yes. They don't keep yeah. them at the zoo, though, do they? Oh, right, right. I see what you mean. Yeah, no, they're extremely difficult animals to keep in the zoo. So, um, yeah, I used to work as a zookeeper. You know, I, I worked in a zoo, and, and they're lovely animals to look after. Um, they, they are actually, they, they just sit in their tree, and they don't cause much of a problem, they don't cause a big mess. But they're very difficult to feed, especially if you don't have a big eucalyptus forest. Um, so they 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 take up a lot of effort if you live in a country that doesn't have native eucalyptus forests. So that's why zoos um, are less inclined to keep them. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very interesting. We'll get to that in a little bit, in a little more depth. I have a lot of... Uh, a lot of markings on, on the, all of these pages I hear. Um, there is, you had a, a, a map, and on that map, it's not really, maybe it's something different. It's the family tree. That's what it is. Right. And what I'm looking at here, so I'm looking at reading, in some places said that the figures that were gray were pretty much not around anymore. Uh, and there were two of them. One of them looked like a tiger, and one looked like a bear. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> were they tigers and bears? Well, sort of. I mean, they, they um, yeah, one of those animals was called Thylacoleo, so that, that's, an, um, it's probably would have been more like a panther. Um, so, or, or a leopard, maybe. So, so it was actually a, an animal that lived in trees. It was a big predator, um, and you know, probably ambushed its prey. But it was actually a mus it's a marsupial. So, like a lot of Australian animals, would have had a pouch. Um, and so, you could imagine a giant killer possum. I guess is the, is the best way of thinking about it. But um, very formidable predator. Huge, strong jaws. Big crushing um, bone crushing teeth and jaws and the other one the one that you you noticed is a bit like a bear was a giant it's called a diprotodon and it would have weighed two to three tons so a very big animal um, and they roamed around a big herbivore probably a bit bit, bit nicer in temperament um, and just a grazing animal so but they they went extinct um, you know when all the megafauna went extinct so at the same time as the saber-toothed tigers and the mammoths and things like that I see. That was last week, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Geologically, <laughs> last week. <laughs> oh, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a time a table of contents guy. That that tells me almost everything about the book and yeah. interests me. <laughs> and good summary. About the book. It is. It is. So I, here's where I'm going to start from. Um, it struck me as rare and plenty. Koalas are rare and plenty. Um, is it? It's not month by month or year by year. It's uh, it's probably a real fact. 
Yeah, yeah, I guess that's the thing I really wanted to highlight is, it, you know, it's uncommon to see a koala in the wild. So even where I live, where koalas are very abundant, I live in an area which has one of the highest densities of koalas in the country, you still don't see them very often. You know, um, you might only, you know, see, unless you go actively looking for them, you might only come across them every couple of months or, you know, once a year even, um, depending on where you live. Whereas like kangaroos, I see them just about every day. So they, they're just in, in the paddock outside. <laughs> they're very common. So I guess that's what I wanted to highlight was that they, they koalas are um, widely dispersed, so they don't live in high density, so you don't see them very often. Um, but in some places there's a lot of them as well. So And they also fluctuate over time, so they, they come and go in areas, so they can be abundant for a, for a few decades and then disappear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, is there any anything anybody can do in terms of it not being rare, or, if, or well, I assume? Go ahead. Yeah, they're, they're basically. I mean, they're naturally um, a widely dispersed animal. So, mm -hmm. you know, some some animals are, are very abundant, and, and other ones just are, are naturally um, widely distributed. So, koalas need a really big habitat in order to support them so they need um a, a, on a, a sort of a, a normal an average koala needs a, an area of forest the size of a sports field um and that's a good forest you know a, 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 a productive forest if they live in arid areas you can have one koala per an area the size of central park in new york so that's a really really big um, home range that that koala needs to support it. Um, so that's why they're, they're rare. But it doesn't mean that they're um, in danger at that level because if you've got a really big area of forest, which we would have had in Australia um, originally, uh, you know, a few hundred years ago, um, then you've still got lots and lots of koalas in that forest because it's a really big area of forest. And those are primarily in the eastern part of Australia? That's right. Yeah, so Australia um, used to be more widely covered in forest. Um, so, so now we have it. We have a forest ban that extends down the east coast of Australia and along the south, um, and then and then the desert extends down into the west. So we've got a little mm -hmm. pocket of forest in the west as well. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the extent of the forest, and that's where the koalas live. They don't live in Western Australia anymore. But in the past, that forest extended inland when the climate was wetter. Um, so the forest was much bigger then and extended right across the West Coast. So koalas were distributed all the way across there as well. What are drop bears? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Dr drop bears are a, a favourite Australian joke. Um, that they particularly <laughs> particularly like to play on um, on gullible journalists, for example, that are visiting Australia from from other countries. Um, yeah, yeah, I so, like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the idea is that you persuade them that there's these dangerous cousins of the of the koala that are drop bears that are that are quite feisty, sometimes even have poisonous teeth, um, you know, and they, and then you give them a give them a koala to hold. <laughs> and right. tell them to be really, really careful and not move. I guess Australians love to to persuade visitors that their country is really dangerous and full of dangerous, deadly animals. Well, when I mean, it does have its fair share of sharks and crocodiles and spiders and poisonous snakes, but mm. um, nothing compared to you know um, grizzly bears or um, cougars or anything like that, though. So um, yeah trying to convince people that koalas, which are one of the most affable and, and mostly good-natured animals, is pretty funny, you know, trying to convince right, yeah. them that they're dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like the part here about um, you are what you eat. Um, <laughs> and I assume that the picture on your book is, is that the one that's got the, oh, it's the picture of you, a koala with you? That's and right, yes, a, yes. <laughs> And koala was busy eating and had all the leaves hanging out of her mouth. <laughs> yeah, you don't have a, a eucalyptus out of your mouth. I don't see her. Here. No, 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 eucalyptus <laughs> doesn't take. You've got to have a special taste for eucalyptus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mercy, mercy, mercy. Um, what what do they eat besides that? Is that all, pretty much all it is? 
that is that is pretty much the sum total of a koala's diet. They're one of the most. Um, there are some other animals that can eat eucalyptus, but koalas are the ones that are the most specialised on eucalyptus. Mm-hmm. So, so that they re- they do occasionally eat other things, but eucalyptus is the is the vast bulk of their diet, and they're they're highly specialised for eating eucalyptus, which which is an unusual adaptation because eucalyptus has a lot of toxins in it, and generally mm-hmm. it's got a toxin that makes mammals feel sick. So. Really? <clears throat> Yeah, so it just sim- simply tastes bad <laughs> if you eat too much of it. That includes us. Mm. Uh, let's see. Okay. From pouch to piggyback. Yeah, so, I mean, um, koalas are marsupials and, you know, that, that means they're a very specific sort of animal that, um, is really common in Australia, but very uncommon everywhere else. So the only other continent to have um, marsupials is South America, which has the opossums. And you know, most North, most North Americans will be familiar with the Virginia opossum, that um, is the the one marsupial that's um, you know naturalised in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but in South America, there's, you know, over 100 species of opossums. And in, in Australia, there's 251 species of marsupials, and they take a wide wow. variety of forms. So, yeah, you get you get things from, um, you know, the, the, ca- the big kangaroos, two-metre-tall kangaroos, right down to tiny little um, quite odd things like marsupial moles and um, little numbats and honey possums and koalas as well. So, so yeah, and they're all united by giving birth to tiny, tiny little young that um, mm-hmm. the size of a jelly bean called joeys and they will crawl up, well, they're called pinkies when they're really small, and they climb up into the mother's pouch and then, and then mm-hmm. grow into a what we would see as a, a normal-sized young and they emerge with a what we you know a kind of a second birth is when they emerge from the pouch and that's about the age and size of development that placental or eutherian mammals like us that's the time we would normally give birth to them so they they Mm -hmm. have an external pregnancy if you like i see i see um i did skip one the guts of the problem ah (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, did I, what did I miss? That's a pretty big chapter. That's a, that. That's what I mean when I say they they um you are what you eat. Really, is that the the secret to the koala's success lies in their stomach. So um, the reason they have become such a successful um you know they they rule the the trees um in the forest as it were is because yeah. they've got a very specialized stomach um that allows them to digest eucalyptus leaves and cope with all those nasty toxins and and that's a really complicated story um how they do that and they have to have a very special um we know we know now that people have to have you know a good healthy gut biome you know that's a big buzzword at the moment is looking looking after your gut biome and making sure you've got mm-hmm. the, the good bacteria and not too many right. of the bad bacteria yeah. well for koalas that's really really important they will die if they don't have the right bacteria to help them digest the leaves and we think that those gut that gut biomes very specific to the particular leaves they're eating. So not just eucalyptus leaves, but the particular species of tree and the particular individual leaves from the tree. So so that's, they're very fussy eaters. Hmm. Sounds like my daddy before he passed on. Uh, <laughs> never know what to do with the guts. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Sociable loners. Yeah, well, I guess um, yeah, koalas are solitary, but they're, they're, they're interesting in that if you see them in a zoo, very often you'll see them sitting together or, you know, cuddling or, you know, just alongside each other, hanging out with each other. You know, they don't yeah. groom each other or do any of those things, but they're definitely not, they're not loners um, in that sense, which surprised me, I guess, given that we know they live a long way apart in the wild. And I think the... The thing with that is that they they have to be solitary because of their food supply. They can't afford to live close to others because they need a big area to feed in. 
Um, mm-hmm. But if they've got plenty of food, as they do in a zoo, then they're quite amiable. And generally speaking, except in the breeding season, they're, they're quite happy to be um, housed with other koalas. And, and so, so I guess I think I, I wanted to talk about them being solitary because I think as we're intensely social animals, um, you know, we have to live in big social groups and, and re- you know, enormous social groups, in fact, if you look at our cities, um, and we tend to look down on animals that are solitary. Um, mm-hmm. We think they're not as sophisticated or not as clever, or, and, and I think that's, that's a bit of a misunderstanding. I, th- I think looking at why animals are solitary or social can give us great insights into our own behaviour as well as into theirs. Interesting, very interesting. The uh, a new arrival. What does that mean? Was yeah, it well, this, <laughs> this is the arrival. I, the way I wrote the book is I wanted to be really focused on the koalas and not on humans. I think we're always we're very self centered animals, and we we like to talk about ourselves um, mm-hmm. and hear things about ourselves. But I really wanted to make sure this story was about the koalas and not about humans. I mean, it's impossible not to tell a story from a human perspective, but I'm trying to shift the focus. So that's why the first half of the book is mostly about koalas and their evolution and how they live. And then the latter bit of the book is about when humans arrive. So so first of all, we have the First Nations people in Australia, the Indigenous Australians who arrived over 60,000 years ago. So they've been in Australia for a very long time um, and have a very long, complex um, and generally sustainable re- relationship with the Australian environment, including koalas. So, um, you know, I-, I wanted to explore their their knowledge of koalas and how they relate to them and, and what information they get from them. And I, and I think that's something you'd probably find really interesting because they, they, they believe that they have these very, very old stories that, you know, are over, you know, some of them are over 7,000 years old. Um, and they're often about how to cope with environmental change and how to find a kind of a peaceful, compatible relationship in the world, to, to find the balance in life. Um, and that's what they, they, were, they will often, if they... If, some Indigenous communities, people will say, if they come across a koala, they will stop and they will talk to the koala and see what advice the koala has for them. Um, so they, they perceive the koala to be a, a giver of knowledge. But I think that business of stopping and listening, it's not just listening to the koala, it's listening to the country, it's listening to the land and mm-hmm. paying attention to what's around you in your environment rather than just rushing off on some goal into the future as we tend to do. I, I think that's actually really good advice for us. And something we need to do a lot more of. I think so. Uh, it sounds good. Um, now, maybe that would help prevent checking out the noise. I have here, I have here war and guns. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. After um, you know, sixty thousand years of achieving some level of ecological balance, a new wave of humans arrived with European colonization of Australia and and as we know that brings a very different approach to um to environment and and land management so um this really you know Australia was only relatively recently colonized just over 200 years ago so we've had and we have to remember that Australia is an isolated continent and it's been isolated from other land masses for well over 100 million years so all of the ant plants and animals have been just having their own little isolated evolutionary history all on their own without much impact from the outside world, apart from, you know, occasional new species arriving. So um, they, it was a big shock for a lot of organisms to have, you know, European humans arrive and there were all their associated um, paraphernalia like um, cats and dogs and rats and pigs and cattle and sheep and uh, foxes and rabbits and <laughs> a whole host of problems. Uh, so that's had a really catastrophic impact on Australia's environment. We've we've cut down most of the forest, so the koala habitat has shrunk and been fragmented into little islands. Um, and 
there was, you know, you can call it a, a, a war. I, t- I talk about war quite a bit because um, koalas are a very na- nationalistic um, yes. icon for Australians, and that really happened during the World Wars. So they mm-hmm. became, you know, a, a, a figure for Australians to um, focus on. Um, but unfortunately, they were also hunted. So um, that was literally a war on the koalas. They were hunted for their fur, and they very nearly went extinct um, because of that hunting. And it, it, it only stopped because um, finally, because um, Herbert Hoover actually banned the importation of um, koala fur into America, and that dried up the trade. Um, and so the koalas were able to recover somewhat after that. That's amazing. That, that's all amazing. Um, future tense. Is there one of those chapters you want everybody to heed from? To... Yeah, I, I guess then, you know, the issue then becomes well, where to from here. Um, you know, after the, after the koalas were, were hunted so, and, and their populations, they were declared extinct in the southern states completely. Um, but there are only a few little pockets of them left. So some some people pop some koalas onto an island in Victoria to keep them safe from bushfires and and other things. Um, and that population remarkably just boomed. It it was incredibly mm. successful, so successful that it was eating out its food. And they had to keep moving the koala to new places. So they they repopulated the entire. Um, southern states of Victoria and South Australia with uh, with koalas from that one island. So it's been a remarkable success story in in wild you know translocation and repopulation and recovery. Um, but it also has its own problems as well of uh, overcrowding and overpopulation because those koalas yeah. are really successful. Um, so we have to look at you know what we're doing now with the koalas. We have we have them going extinct in some forests and and overpopulating others, and all of it's probably due to do with their habitat being they, they're stuck on little islands. So so they either go extinct because the islands are too small and too degraded, the, mm-hmm. the forest islands, um, mm-hmm. or they over overpopulate and um, eat all the trees. So. So you know we've got a lot of work to do thinking about how we protect, how we how we restore those habitats and protect them into the future, because it's not just for the koalas. Obviously, it's for all the species that depend on the forest, and we are one of those species. We also right. depend on forests for our well-being. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's good the humans got included. Um, tell me and tell my audience where would they go to buy your book. Okay, so it's, yeah, <laughs> it's um being published in the US um and in in North America in um by W. W. Norton. So it's being distributed by the publisher that should be in all good bookshops. It's always great to go down and support your local independent bookshop um and buy your books from them. But you can also buy it online um, and it's available as an ebook and as an audio book if you prefer to listen to your books or or read them on your on your tablets or or phones or whatever. So it's available in all formats. Um, you should be able to find it wherever and order it in that's, if they don't have it. That's good. I wanted to also ask you a couple of questions I over jumped over. Um, what's the normal age? The age of uh, um, so how long do they live um, how long do they live yes yeah yeah um look they can they live up to i think the oldest koala from memory is about in is in their early 20s um but you can get and but that's in captivity um but mm-hmm. you can get koalas that live up to 18 um in the wild but um it does does depend the ones that live a long time tend to be um females older females that that live long time young males often suffer from a lot of mortality because they're they're out roaming roaming the streets as it were (laughs) roaming Mm -hmm. the forest um so they tend to get into trouble with cars and dogs and things like that um, so they, they they may not live up so long so you know the the average age is probably much lower in the wild uh, might be six or seven, um, but they can live for a long time. You know, the the, the old wise ones um, hang in there for a, for a lot longer. 
Do they have a bit of a language between them that, that they talk, they communicate with between each other? Yeah, so they have, they have, um, they have I guess, two main uh, different languages. Uh, the first one is a chemical language, so they communicate by scent a lot. So, you know, because they travel long distances and they don't bump into each other all that often, they communicate by scent marking the trees. So, you know, koalas will always sniff the base of the tree before they go up it so they can tell whether it's already got a koala in it or how recently a koala's been there and whether that, whether it's a koala they want to approach or avoid. So they can tell whether it's male or female, whether it's in breeding condition or not, um, whether it's a big male or a small male. So there's a lot of information in that. But the other thing they do is they communicate over long distance. So they bellow. So they, they have a, because they're a long way apart and they have to find each other to breed, they have a, a it sounds a bit, some people say it's like a demonic donkey. So they have a long brain top. It's not the most attractive sound in the world. Right. It sounds a yeah. bit like a chainsaw start, starting up. But um, it's very effective at um going across long distances and and they also have a whole range of other communications usually usually it's about keeping each other away so uh -huh. um they they squeal and yip and bark and <laughs> <laughs> it, that's great the, yeah <laughs> during the breeding season the males are often a little bit more enthusiastic than the females so the the males are doing lots of bellowing and the females are doing lots of shouting and screaming and telling them to keep away so that that's a very noisy scene that happens in the in the forest at springtime you can hear right. that going on a lot right. i had to change my chair a bit because i want a cue to see if you can look over my shoulder and oh, see yes, something yes. up there there's what do you a little see? quality i got one behind me too <laughs> and, and on my I've, bookshelf I've, i've got the that's koala lovely. and and the pups there's three four three pups I nice. assume they call them pups. Is that right? They call them joeys, actually. Joeys, mm. okay. Joeys. Yeah, all, all marsupial babies are called joeys. Yeah. Well, now, this this group here uh, was uh, a gift from my uh, wife's grandmother. And uh, she was from Australia. Huh. And, and she gave this, uh, I guess, small family or to keep together uh and it was for her for being born when she was right. born she re she received that and now we've had it first my wife is 63 years old right. and, and so we've been carrying it around for <laughs> we've moved 28 <laughs> times let me tell you <laughs> that's great they make lovely they make lovely um gifts the the, the The stuffed toys are, are lovely um, gifts for children and they're, they're very appealing animals for young children. I think there's a lot of features of koalas that remind us of young children. You know, their faces are very, um, you know, they have a very similar face to ours in terms of the structure, the eyes all face, face forward facing. Um, yeah. And they also, you know, because they hug things and they hold on to things and they'll put their arms up to be picked up, um, this this appeals to us as humans so so they elicit a very maternal response from humans i think or paternal response a parental response um, absolutely from, mm. danielle i'm so glad that uh, you were able to be on my show today it's uh, quite an honor to speak to someone that knows all the world on the south end <laughs> <I'm below>. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see um My listeners, I have to thank them for tuning in, um, searching for integrity. And um, I have a something I stole from the old Cowboys and Indians days. Um, so long and happy trails to all. <laughs>